Today's talk uh, is about um, what I've learned in the last year uh, at Direct Access. Hopefully, um, it might be of some use to you guys. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, and it's all about, I've spent the last year trying to uh, automate all our deployments across lots of environments and systems and teams. Um, and uh, <coughs> yeah, so today this, this talk is all about production deployments. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I love production deployments. I even have a deployment shirt. Everybody knows when I wear the shirt to work that I'm doing a deployment. Um, <coughs> and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, who, who, uh, who's, who enjoys produc uh, production deployment day? I mean, uh, obviously I'm one of them. I love deployments. Am I completely alone? Okay, there's a couple there. Who, who, uh, who hates production deployments? Who hates deployment day? And uh, does nobody else here ship software or what? <laughs> what about the rest of you? Or like somewhere in the middle there? Okay, it's just another day at work. Huh? Okay, oh! I want to do the talk. <laughs> So, um, so, yeah, and it comes from, I'm a long time .NET dev, um, long time, you can see how white my beard is. Um, so I go back to ZX Spectrum days and playing on the Beeb and coding in Turbo Basic and Visual Pascal and C++ and um, I've always um, denied the fact that I'm a bit of a nerd because um, I always wanted to be a jock, but actually I'm a complete nerd and I'm finally coming to terms with it. Um, but I also do other stuff, and uh, I was lucky enough to be involved at a company called safarina.com for many years um, when the internet started. And I was the guy who was deploying the live site to my Celeron 300 under my desk in the early days on uh, Access and ASP pages. And um, production deployment days got more and more uh, intense as the years rolled by. And um, yeah, some, normally they were great, but sometimes they were bad. And this is a little, uh, we were based out in um, Komiki and I, we used to do a lot of big wave surfing and this, this reminds me of a, of a production deployment. The code is now released into production, the website's running, it's all looking fantastic. <laughs> but sometimes you go out to celebrate and you come back at 12 o'clock pissed <laughs> and you discover that nobody can submit quotes on the site and you're there till 6 a.m. fixing the problem inebriated. Um, yeah, so for me that's production deployments are much like big wave surfing. Uh, it's either really fantastic because your stuff gets out into the world and it's all beautiful or uh, it's a disaster and it's a problem. Um, so I do like deployments um, and um, so my talk today, um, I must actually watch the time, oh crumbs, I forgot to start my timer. Um, yeah, so we're going to look at where deploy automation kind of sits as in DevOps as an entirety. Um, advantages, although I think I'm speaking to the converted here, but you guys will want to maybe convince your bosses why. So it's worth running through. Um, some engineering principles. Uh, what was the challenge of direct access? Uh, I'm going to little, do a quick Octopus deploy demo because that's what we used. Um, or intro and some, and some demos. Uh, I see the security guys here, so he's going to be upset when I VPN onto, onto the network. Um, and some learnings from the last year. Um, so why, why do we want to automate? Um, and what, what, what are the, where does deploy automation fit in, um, in our DevOps capabilities? So th there's a lovely yellow the DevOps handbook, that yellow book. I hope a lot of you guys have got it. It's really thick and meaty, got a lot of stuff in it, it's worth, worth reading. And in that book, um, they talk about flow, and flow is, is basically getting your work out into production. It's taking your development and getting it into ops. And they talk a lot about the, the next capability as a whole is the feedback capability. So how quick and comprehensive and responsive is your feedback loops and what you've set up in terms of feeding back and what's actually going on? Uh, and then the third is a kind of a culture of continual learning and experimentation. And obviously deployment automation fits firmly into the, how, do you, how, do we, how capable are we in flowing our work out? 
um, and deployment automation is obviously a key tenant of that. Um, and the other ones which we, you know, we, we probably all know about uh, are probably the main aspects of really great engineering in, in DevOps in terms of how the work flows from the commit and finally into production. Um, but I'm not going to cover that obviously today. Today is all about deployment automation. Um, so what are the advantages of having full deployment automation? Um, at direct access, probably the biggest advantage has been the ability to sorry, I must stop carrying this microphone, um, have production-like environments um, available to everyone. Um, it's all about creating deployment repeatability and consistency, um, makes frequent low-risk releasing feasible. You can't do frequent low-risk releases if your deployment automation is not automated. You're just going to spend too much time doing the actual deployments um, and have too many issues with, with mistakes and errors. Um, it eliminates all versioning uncertainty. You now know exactly what code is in every environment for every system. Um, and another important thing, which was a big problem at Direct Access, um, I'll go into a bit later, is that it allows you to, to manage your configuration of your, the way your applications need to be configured in all your environments separately to your actual, app, your actual app, application code. Because these two things essentially change at a different cadence. Um, quick few engineering principles. Um, so one of the things about deployment automation is, you know, we probably all, you know, I was used to working in a sort of standard Git flow way for many years. Um, you know, when you're going to you merge into a new branch or to develop to release branch and you've set up your CI to build and deploy to your dev server or maybe your QA server and you merge to master and build, deploy to production. The concept with deployment automation is that no, you build once and you deploy it many times. And it's a bit of a paradigm shift because things like debug versus release builds now become a bit of a problem. You don't really do that anymore. Other things like code contracts also become a little bit of a problem which are kind of build time dependent. Um, it's a bit of a, I mean, I'm a huge fan of code, code contracts um, and it's sad that it's kind of disappeared off the .NET landscape at the moment, um, but I'm getting sidetracked. So from a release management perspective, you want to build your artifacts once. Put a rubber st a stamp on it saying this is version 1.1 of my artifacts and you never ever change it again. And there's, no ever, you, there's never any discussion about you know, what was the version of the code. You don't need to go to a specific co commit point. You eliminate so many problems by not having to build it again for that same version of your software. Um, so that's one engineering principle that was new to me. Um, another one is you want to deploy your systems the same way to every environment. Um, if you have a, like a, say an Azure API gateway in front of some of your systems in prod, but then you just don't bother in dev and QA, you just use them directly, you're setting yourself up, you're probably going to end up manually configuring your API gateway when you, when you deploy to production. Um, you don't want to do that. You want to actually spin up an API gateway for dev. You want all your systems to deploy the same way. Uh, and very sort of in the same theme, you want to strive for logically identical environments because this speaks to your deployment automation being the same in every environment. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they have to be the same size, of course. And obviously, there's always financial constraints and other constraints, but wherever possible, you really want to keep your environments in, as logically identical as possible. Um, And then, as I mentioned before, um, it's turned out that SIP, the, the whole exercise of moving the actual configuration values for all the applications out of the code and into a separate configuration management system has really taken the mess out of uh, the current configuration situation. Okay, um, you want to be able to rebuild any environment in its entirety on demand. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the challenge, um, direct access, um, it's got a really great dev um, setup. There's about 13 dev teams. It's about 50 or 100, well, like 70 of us, I think. Um, and um, 
yeah, I was lucky enough to put my hand up and suggest that this whole thing be done. And um, yeah, so I jumped in about a year ago into this. Um, and most of you guys probably sort of would recognize something like this. It's, uh, this is old and probably totally incorrect and you can't read anything uh, about it. But you know, that's your typical corporate type landscape. I think the purple ones are external integrations. All the white ones are internal systems. Uh, there's m we're massively coupled to the, the old monolithic database. Um, but they've been building lots and lots of microservices and chopping up the monolith for quite a few years now. So the original central monolith, which is actually 10 apps, now has um, 100 microservices and, and various things all around it. Um, so of course, the, the, the challenge then is dev team number one needs to work on system A and B. But in order to do that in dev, they need to have a whole bunch of, uh, some of, or a lot of the other systems also running in dev. And then maybe they'll use others from integration or pre-prod. Um, and then dev team two is working on something, something different. Um, and this is actually an enormous challenge. Um, I arrived to, to, to do a, pro a project on the monolith. Um, and after that, we spent six, eight months on it. And probably about a third of the time, we were struggling with our environment breaking for various reasons. Um, so, um, and during that time, I now saw, saw the, the, you know, the, the, the issues. Um, manual deploys to production, there was you know, often issues. Excessive time trying to get dev environments spun up and, and working. And we had a lot of dev teams. So we, had about, we have about 15 or 20 QA environments for the dev guys to work in. And um, it's no mean feat to keep those things working. Um, and the result was the business didn't trust any environment except pre-production and production. So no QA or real UAT or real regression happened anywhere outside of pre-prod. And um, it's still a bit the case like that. Um, but that was a serious problem and it, and it causes a bottleneck. Um, so we picked Octopus Deploy to, as the sort of tool to, for our deployment automation journey. It's been around about 10 years. It's very popular in the .NET world. It comes from the old days of deploying a, a web app, IS web app, Windows service uh, onto Windows VMs. That's where it originally starts from. Um, so I just quickly want to kind of explain where um, the sort of paradigm shift from your CI server kind of building, testing, and deploying to your CI server building and testing, and then your deployment automation software um, kind of working with the release artifact repository, uh, deploy automation, and configuration management. So here in this diagram, um, we've got our Jenkins or whatever there, the build server, and we put our artifacts somewhere. Who knows where that might be? We might deploy straight to dev. We might deploy manually to QA in production, I don't know. But in the Octopus, or any deploy automation world, we put our build artifacts in a repository, and then we use our automation tool to deploy to all our environments. Um, so you can pretty much deploy anything with Octopus these days. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but we're mainly a .NET shop, so we're deploying .NET framework and core APIs mainly, uh, Windows services. Um, but you can, you can deploy, there's native support for Azure and AWS, um, native Kubernetes support coming as well. You can pretty much deploy anything that you can put into a NuGet package um, and, and do anything you can script in PowerShell or Bash C Sharp. Um, so in the Octopus world, you, there's a central server application which runs on Windows. And your, your target VMs, which can be Linux or Windows, you put a little client listening sort of tent, it's called the tentacle, of course. What else would they call it? Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it listens to the, the central server. It can also poll, because often you have firewall constraints. Um, and uh, the act of running a deployment, the service is right, okay, we, somebody's deploying something to this environment and you're involved, Mr. Target Server. Uh, typically what's happening in the .NET traditional app situation is we're unpacking a NuGet package onto the server. We're applying our configuration 
transformations and variables and rules and resolutions, uh, which are, are there many. Uh, and then we are setting up an IS app pool or website. Um, and that's, that's it's kind of a sort of a typical traditional deployment. Um, so Octopus has its own NuGet package library, which it uses as its artifact source. You don't use it as a normal NuGet package library for sharing client libraries. It's only for Octopus to deploy your own artifacts. Um, it can also get artifacts from Docker and Maven, uh, GitHub for some stuff as well. Um, can I just ask, who's keeping time? How, how much time have we okay, have actually gone through? I've got some uh, demos to, because I'm only like 12 minutes. I think I've got quite a bit of time. I was hoping to do some demos. Um, so, <clears throat> so I've got a, um, um, a little app here, and I've got a little build script, which, which would typically be on my build server. Um, and um, there's a little utility that they provide for you to basically pack your artifacts is that what's left? Is that all? Okay, right. <laughs> According to me, I've only been 13 minutes down. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna skip the demo because I thought I've got more time than I have. Um, so, um, yeah, it's really easy to, to, to basically pack and publish your stuff into the library. And then in Octopus, you have the concept of environments, targets, and roles. The target is a Linux or Windows VM, and a role is just a tag to identify the server for a particular application. Um, and then the deployment projects are simply a bunch of steps that will deploy one or more things, and you can pretty much do anything in the, in the project steps. Um, so if I have a look at a very simple project here, uh, you can see uh, I've got three steps. I'm going, to, I'm going to run some database migrations, um, which actually just deploys a little console app, which migrates the database. Uh, and I've got a little deployment script here, which is going to actually do that. Then I'm going to deploy a web API, and I'm going to send an email report. Um, and it's literally not, uh, you know, that's the kind of simple project with a few basic steps. Um, wait. Um, so, uh, the, the way that you apply your configuration is pretty much the main kind of change from traditional .NET deployments. Um, and you, your configuration Octopus is all stored at variables which live in the projects, but you can also have global project um, variable libraries. Um, the other thing is that there's a concept of a release. So, a deployment project may have two or three things it's deploying. But you create a release of that project, um, and you give it a specific version number, and it's basically a photograph of all the configuration, the deployment process, and the exact versions of the artifacts, and that, that never changes. So rolling back becomes a, a, a case of de de always deploying your previous release. Um, yes? Ten proper minutes. Wow. Okay. Great. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a real operating system here. <laughs> uh, okay. So I've got got a few minutes. Um, so in order for me to make a cre uh, create a release here, um, so I'm just going to run my build script. Um, which is going to build and send up. Uh, this is a little project I've just started for a client. So I'm just having a look here. These are the only two things in the package library. Uh, there we go. The one's up there now. Let's wait for the other one. Yeah, they're both there. Okay, so I can go to my project now. I can create a release. And it's saying yeah, it wants to version it with this version, pre-release version. My actual packages are that version, so now I can save my release, and so this is the, my. Uh, and now, really, I'm ready to deploy it. Um, so I can click deploy, 
and off it goes. And I don't even think I've changed anything. Um, but that release is, is inviolate. It's, it's never, it will never change. Um, sorry, let me just get back on track. Um, so I wanted to show, got a few minutes. Uh, I've got some learnings and a few things I wanted to show. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is just show you the kind of Yay, that was nice, worked first time. So here is the monolith. Um, IT guys, I have checked that there's nothing here that's, that's all just informational. Um, our security guys in the audience. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is a, it's, it's a bit, there's 10 apps in here. Uh, we're checking credentials, we're doing a whole lot of things to make sure that it's all gonna work. Um, and the amount of, all the configuration is sitting here in variables. Um, I have a look at it, something, you know, the, the, basically what you do is you, you try and configure by convention, but you will typically scope a variable's value for a particular environment. So you'll say in production it's this, and maybe in pre-production it's that, and for every other environment it's something else. And you'll see here as well that a lot of the systems that are consumed by other systems, we publish their configuration and then consume the configuration uh, in library configuration sets. So, um, yeah, these are all available through library sets. Um, what else did I want to show you? Um, <coughs> then there's also, there's also an ability to um, set up a roll-up project where you are deploying other deployment projects. Um, so you can create a release uh, at the end of the week. Um, oh no, this is not the one I've actually used, it's this one. And uh, basically make a snapshot of what production is like. Um, so you might have 75 systems, you have the exact version of all 75 of those systems, and then anybody can deploy any of those, the ones that they want, into their environment, and they know that it's exactly the same as production. Um, so this is where we're heading. Um, I'm only halfway through my job here in terms of finishing this entire landscape um, because we still have all the database automation to go. Um, okay, so let me start wrapping up. Um, okay, so the things I've learned is that, um, I mean, we're still busy trying to set up new two UAT environments, a regression environment, and then we want a single integration environment instead of in addition to all the dev environments. Um, it's really difficult to make these things and keep them going if you can't actually rebuild the whole thing from scratch. Okay, so that includes things like setting up your rabbit and setting up your databases. You, you really need to, each individual project needs to deploy itself in its entirety. Um, otherwise, if you, if you, if you automate 80% of it, you'll always get behind. You'll always, you'll never set up that environment you need. Um, standardizing environment configuration has been um, made our lives a lot simpler. With the, like 17, 17 dev environments, we did things like make all systems be at system name dot environment name dot direct access dot COSA. And then suddenly, you know, instead of using machine names and IP addresses, um, you know, you can clean things up by simply doing things simply and naming by convention. Um, the, <coughs> the sticking to the premise of we want to keep all the environments logically identical has really, really been um, a help. Um, we've also used another thing called tenants. Um, a, lot of, a lot of you may have many clients who are your production clients. So you might be deploying to 10 or 1,000 production clients. Um, and in that case, production for you is, a, is 100 instances of production. Uh, in our case, we've got 19 instances of QA that are for our dev teams. Um, so we, there's another, uh, you can have tenants, tenants in your environment in Octopus, um, and that's highly recommendable for that situation. Um, 
and then publishing library configuration has been hugely helpful. Um, and the, the ability for us now to deploy, to, the developers can now deploy it to production, but they don't actually need to have access to any machines in production. Um, and we've been able to, to put the whole thing into change control uh, with AD security group access, which is entirely controlled by ops and change control. Um, so production is pretty much locked down. Um, and ops has been quite happy about all of that, I think, I hope. Um, and the other thing I've learned is that I've kind of left the database automation to the end because we kept fighting about whether to use a model-based or a script-based approach. Um, and um, in hindsight, that's been a mistake. You kind of want to completely finish each system as you go and, and don't leave like some aspects right for the end. Um, yeah, so it's been technical talk. I, I would have, there was a few other demos I've, I was thinking of doing. Um, but thank you very much. Any, have you got any questions? Hi, Mark. Um, here? Hi. In front. Hi. Sorry. Uh, could you just elaborate a bit on the database automation side of things and your thoughts there? Um, so it's been a point of contention because, uh, you know, different developers like different ways of doing things. Um, and there's... There's two main approaches. The one is a, is a change-based approach, or, uh, and the one is a model-based approach. So the change-based approach says, okay, um, we, you know, when we, as, as this database has evolved over time, you know, we initially we created it, and then we made another change, and then we added this reference data, and then we made that change, and then we removed that. And you, you, you make an automation solution that will do those changes one at a time. Okay? The other paradigm is you say, okay, I have a tool which is a model of my target database in the state that it needs to be, and or the subset of it that I want to track, which is typically the schema, uh, the reference data stuff, maybe the security as well. Um, in my experience, the change-based approach is very flex, is, is very powerful, because um, there's literally nothing you can't do, okay? But there are some caveats. You guys need to know how to write SQL. If you don't have SQL skills, then it's a problem. Um, if lots and lots of people are changing, if lots of teams are working on the same database, um, you can have, you know, it, 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 it also can be a downside. Um, the model-based approach, I have heard some war stories and seen like, um, uh, you know, big scripts being generated to, to apply changes to, to the database. Um, and, I ha and I personally haven't used it that much, so I can't really comment that much. Um, but yeah, those are the two main main paradigms, and it, it's kind of, it, it's also a little bit like, in my opinion, like you know when you first start using continuous integration, you know, there's no point in sitting around for six months arguing whether you're going to use Team City or Jenkins. You must just you must use one of them. Okay, so we eventually decided that teams can decide what route they want to go, and it's up to the teams to decide, um, and we're actually not too fussed which way you go. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Great. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>